After Fox showed that the status quo of three major broadcast networks wasn't immune to invasion by a fledgling network, Paramount piped up, took notice, and partnered with a station group, Chris Craft Industries, to form the United Paramount Network, a broadcast network meant to go head-to-head -head with the Big Four. Though it started strong, by 1999 the network was languishing in sixth place, even behind another fledgling network, the WB. Seven short years later, UPN disappeared from the airwaves, and the Big Four is still just the Big Four. So why couldn't UPN replicate Fox's success? What could have possibly happened that led to the demise of a network that showed so much promise? Well, it all started with a merger between UPN's parent company, Viacom, and the CBS Corporation. Now, it's important to understand what both of these companies actually are. CBS, of course, had the TV network. This is CBS. But CBS Television was just a subset of a larger company, confusingly named the CBS Corporation, which had more goodies up its sleeve. The CBS Corporation is actually the same company that was known as Westinghouse until 1997. You know, Westinghouse. They have a really cool logo, courtesy of Paul Rand. Westinghouse was an electric company, making a wide variety of things, but most known for things like appliances. They were also involved in broadcasting, and they were instrumental in the foundation of NBC. They also telecast the very first live TV broadcast in 1951. And they owned some radio and TV stations. But don't get me wrong, they were an electric company first. At least until 1990. After a lot of financial struggles and a new CEO, they sold off most of their electrical assets and invested $15 billion into the broadcasting business, which consisted of buying Infinity Radio, which owned the venerable Howard Stern Show, the national network CMT, and yes, CBS. Seeing as they weren't much of an electric company anymore, they renamed themselves the CBS Corporation in 1997. Viacom, of course, I've been talking about a lot, but aside from owning Paramount and half of UPN, I've hardly brushed on the scope of what the company controls, and that is a lot. They had TV stations, yes, but they also owned MTV, VH1, Nickelodeon, TV Land, Showtime, and the Movie Channel. Of course, they had Paramount and all the goodies that entailed, but perhaps the largest of all of their properties was Blockbuster, which they purchased in 1994, the same year they acquired Paramount. There were obvious benefits for both sides of the merger. The biggest reason it hadn't happened up to this point was a lingering FCC regulation that stated that one company was forbidden from owning more than one TV station in a given market. And since Viacom was the owner of several UPN stations, among others, others, and CBS owned and operated a bunch of stations nationwide, their hands were tied unless those rules got eliminated. And then, in August of 1999, the FCC threw them a bone. They allowed a company to own more than one station, but there were some asterisks. For one, there needed to be seven other stations that were all independent from one another remaining after the purchase. Though you could get around this rule if you acquired a company that owned some stations, and your acquisition of the company was the only way it could remain afloat. For another, you couldn't control two out of the big four in the same market. And, you know, that's fair. Now, this isn't to say that there weren't legal hoops left for the merger to overcome. For starters, there was a law that stated that you couldn't own so many television stations that you reached over 35% of the United States. Viacom, after the merger, would have 41%. However, after Viacom argued that those rules were antiquated in the days of broadcast and cable, that hoop was cleared. A big, uncleared hoop was the law that stated, plain and simple, that you can't own two major broadcast networks. With this merger, both CBS and UPN would come under the same corporate roof, which wouldn't have been approved with these laws in place. However, especially considering UPN's last place status at the time, Viacom retained hope that they'd dial that rule back a little bit. If the FCC decided not to, that left Viacom with the option of rolling back their ownership in UPN to 33% or less, or just selling the network back in full to its original owner, Chris Kraft. Though Viacom would have very much liked to hang on to UPN, it wasn't going to make or break the merger for them, so they decided not to push too hard and just wait on the FCC to make a call. Now, there are a lot of business moguls involved with the combined Viacom that you'll need to know. On top was this guy, Sumner Redstone. He was the CEO of Viacom who made the company what it was, and he was 76 by the time the merger was announced. Second in command at the combined company would be Mel Karmazin, who was the CEO of the CBS Corporation and would take the titles of President and COO at Viacom. Leslie Moonves had been the head of CBS Television since 1995, and he would keep that title at Viacom. He was the driving force behind CBS effectively rebranding itself, and it had paid off for the network despite a rough situation with affiliates following the rise of Fox. Tom Freston led the MTV networks, which consisted of most of Viacom's cable channels. Dean Valentine, I'm sure you remember, was the head of UPN and had been attempting to expand the network's appeal to a broader audience, but had been met with lukewarm success in doing so, largely due to the fact that UPN was short on cash. Kerry McCluggage was the CEO of Paramount Television, which was UPN's parent company that also housed the production studio. Finally, there was Jonathan Dolgen, who was the head of Viacom Entertainment, which was the parent of Paramount Pictures. 
Phew, got all that? Good. Now, one of the critical aspects of any merger is the leadership of the two companies working well together, or at least peacefully coexisting. In this merger, however, there was some perceived tension between Karmazin and Redstone. Both men liked being in control, and both were different in their business ideologies. One of the earliest examples of this was a disagreement the two men had regarding Blockbuster. Redstone was considering selling off Blockbuster to shareholders about a month after the merger was announced. He believed Blockbuster's time was running out, even though it was still pumping out profits. He saw the video on demand services that were popping up everywhere, and Redstone believed that once those develop more, Blockbuster wouldn't be able to compete. Karmazin, on the other hand, believed that more was better as long as it remained profitable. And he strongly pushed back against the sale of Blockbuster precisely because it was still profitable. He had also been pretty publicly eyeing companies like NBC and even AOL, which at the time was a gigantic company, as potential targets for yet another merger. He would do just about anything if it meant a higher stock price. In my opinion, once you have gone through the basic stuff, you know, you've consolidated, you've looked at your expenses, you've done everything you can do. Now, what is left for you to do to make it better? I believe one of the things that is left to do to make it better is to do some consolidation. So um, when I was the CEO of CBS, um, Bob Wright was the CEO of NBC. Hated it when I would say this. I wanted CBS to buy NBC. And I didn't see why on earth somebody shouldn't be allowed to own two networks. Look at all of these channels out there. Think about why do you need CBS News and NBC News? There would be a tremendous amount of benefits for shareholders, all right? Maybe disruptive for some employees, but very uh, significant amount of value for shareholders if those two companies... 15 years ago, I said, should be allowed to merge. Redstone, on the other hand, was way more strategic. He always had sort of a master plan, whereas Karmazin's master plan was a very simple three steps. One, sell things that are losing money. Two, buy things that are making money. Three, watch the stock price grow. Outsiders were skeptical that Redstone and Karmazin could peacefully coexist, and under the rules of the merger, Redstone would be succeeded by Karmazin upon him stepping down, and Karmazin's contract made him a permanent fixture unless 14 out of the 18 board members wanted him out. When when it came to the Blockbuster decision, Karmazin won the argument, though Redstone put into place a deal with Enron for a video-on-demand service, and if you know Enron's fate, you know that didn't last very long. The damage to the public's perception of these two executives was already done. The two executives were now seen pretty much as just incompatible. Redstone had always kept his business life and his personal life very close. His closest friends were business executives he worked alongside, and he interacted with all of the big players in his company very frequently over dinner. On the other hand, Mel had never cared for that style of business, and he treated Redstone as a boss, not a friend, which Redstone interpreted as a disdain for himself. For that reason, Redstone never cared for Karmazin, and at the end of the day, he was the man in charge. For the time being, though, they managed to set their differences aside, and they proceeded with the merger. Now, over at UPN, things were rebounding. At the end of the last season, UPN was solidly last place. Performance was terrible, but Viacom promised to keep supporting the network, as did Chris Kraft. The leadership at both companies remained strangely optimistic despite the state of things. They just kept wishing something new that season would really catch fire. Then Vince McMahon came along with the match and some gasoline in the form of WWF SmackDown. The wrestling madhouse they had acquired from cable did exactly what they were hoping for, roped in a young male audience that could compete with the other networks, including Fox and even the Big Three. Their male viewership more than septupled among teenagers and nearly quadrupled for 18 to 34 year olds. It was a juggernaut, defying the expectations of just about everyone involved. On Thursdays, UPN often boasted third place. Other nights, things were doing all right. UPN was doing better, certainly. They had some shows that were doing well. The Good Old Reliables roped in decent performance, and the new show, Girlfriends, found a nice audience as well. There was one show, though, on Fox that was a surprise success and kept robbing all the other networks of a valuable audience. Its success came as a surprise because several people thought that the show's genre, sitcoms, was dead. But when Malcolm in the Middle premiered in January 2000, it showed that there was still a massive audience for sitcoms. The show the show was a huge win for Fox, who had been struggling to recapture their audience that was consistently fleeing to other networks. And when UPN saw those numbers rolling in, they were kicking themselves. Why? Because Malcolm in the Middle was originally developed for UPN. They ordered a pilot, but they decided the show was a dud, and so declined to pick it up for a season. Fox wasted no time, picked it up, and 20 million viewers later, it was clear they had a hit on their hands. Malcolm in the Middle lasted for seven seasons on Fox, while UPN was still waiting on their next big 
thing. And they thought it might come in the form of another venture taken on by their ratings messiah at the time, Vince McMahon. Vince, who thought the NFL was for pansies, decided it would be a great idea to launch a football league in the same vein of the WWF that would be centered more on violence and drama rather than fair rules and sportsmanship. This was the idea that would become known as the XFL, and it was set to debut in February of 2001. Since UPN already broadcast WWF SmackDown, it was likely to be in a good position to acquire the broadcast rights to some XFL games. However, it didn't take long until NBC, who had recently lost the rights to most major NFL events, decided that they would be a 50% partner in ownership of the league. UPN picked up the rights to Sunday evening XFL games, but Saturdays on NBC would house the premiere, the championship, and so on. Meanwhile, the legal situation surrounding UPN's position in the merger heated up. Chris Kraft had sued to block the merger altogether because Viacom and Chris Kraft included a clause in their contract that they were not to make a deal with a competing network. Viacom told them to cool it because the merger hadn't even gotten anywhere yet, but they also issued an ultimatum which was backed by the New York Supreme Court. Chris Kraft had two options. Sell their 50% share of UPN to Viacom, relinquishing control of the network to the new combined Viacom in return for $5 million, or buy back Viacom's 50% share at the cost of $5 million. Chris Kraft wanted nothing more than to keep the partnership alive. Their deep-pocketed partner was a great benefit to them. They kept fighting in the courtroom to dismantle the merger altogether, but the courts weren't having it. The FCC was also playing nice with Viacom and had made the allowance for them to own both CBS and UPN, so Chris Kraft was the only thing potentially standing in their way. Eventually, they had to make a decision. Knowing that they couldn't possibly support UPN, which had lost nearly a billion dollars in five years, they painstakingly gave up the network in full to Viacom. And just like that, Chris Kraft was out of the picture. Oh, okay, not entirely, because all of those stations that Chris Kraft owned still had to carry UPN, or else there would be a huge issue for the network. Chris Kraft, when the merger was first proposed, was open to a total acquisition of all of its assets, including its stations, by Viacom. However, Viacom wasn't interested because they believed Chris Kraft's price of $3.1 billion to be too high, and negotiations were fruitless. After Viacom had issued the ultimatum, and Chris Kraft had sold off their stake of UPN, Chris Kraft once again tried to get Viacom to take the rest of their stuff as well. Viacom wanted to, but the problem was the same, too high of a price. Chris Kraft found a suitor soon enough, and it was Fox television stations. They were willing to cough up the money to buy out Chris Kraft and the 10 huge stations that they owned. But since the Fox television stations and the Fox Broadcasting Company were owned by the Fox Entertainment Group, I know a lot of Foxes, uh, questions about whether the Fox Entertainment Group would use the Chris Kraft stations to broadcast Fox instead of UPN surfaced. If they had decided to do that, it would have been bad news for UPN because these stations included their New York and Los Angeles stations, and losing out on those two markets alone would be catastrophic. No TV network had ever succeeded without owning a network in those markets. Fox television stations was also going to cross that 35% of the nation threshold with their purchase, so the legality of the acquisition was brought into question. So, recognizing that UPN wouldn't survive if those stations ceased to carry it, Rupert Murdoch, the head of the Fox empire, said he would be open to negotiations with Viacom in regards to keeping the network on those stations. Viacom and Fox reached an agreement to keep UPN on the stations throughout 2003, which was a short-term deal with nothing about subsequent years included. Because of the nature of the deal, there was some uncertainty about the future of UPN. Murdoch even began to express wishes to buy out a stake of, or all, of UPN. Viacom squirmed and adamantly did not want that to happen, so the big Fox stations kept broadcasting Viacom's UPN as affiliates for the time being. Now that they had gotten that whole issue squared away, they had really gotten rid of Chris Kraft, and they rejoiced. For years, they had viewed the company as a sort of anchor around their neck. Paramount didn't want to have to deal with Chris Kraft's antics anymore, and now, they didn't have to. The Paramount guys really did look at the Chris Kraft guys as a bunch of rubes who came in from, you know, out in the country, and they were perfectly willing to slice off better pieces of the beast for themselves. Um, as Paramount did benefit incredibly and they had lots of different agendas, and they really, you know, basically took the Chris Kraft guys for a ride. Um, and the Chris Kraft guys were not very swift um, and had no management, and no infrastructure, no way of understanding anything. It was just a couple of guys, basically. Uh, and they had no ability to, to deal with what they were dealing with. And they had no particular financial skills, no particular creative skills. And that wasn't a good thing because they each had control over the budget uh, 100%. So they could paralyze the network. And that is, in fact, what they did on a continuing basis. When they stopped speaking to each other, they would stop approving the budget. So you would no longer have the ability to produce shows or to order episodes, or to order mid-season episodes, without going to each of them. And it was just a, a, they created a situation where the network couldn't possibly succeed. 
The negative aspects of the Chris Craft partnership were illustrated perfectly in the very name of the network, which was never universally liked. For some, it didn't have the same ring as a network like ABC or NBC. Others who didn't know what the letters in UPN even stood for thought the name was arbitrarily meaningless. Another common sentiment was that both Fox and the WB had clear emotional connections for viewers who were familiar with the movie studios that they shared their names with. The WB even retained a similar logo. So now that UPN was no longer owned by the U in their name, United Television, they decided to drop it, which brought the name down to PN. But they decided that was dumb, so they dropped the initialism for the full name, which was what many had pictured the name to be before it was announced in 1994. The network was proposed to be renamed the Paramount Network. The logo would also be changed to a logo taking definite cues from the logo of the movie studio. Some were excited, and a new era for the network was thought to be on the horizon. However, the affiliates of the network were not thrilled. The rebranding faced backlash from them because they feared that changing the name of an established network would cause confusion and resultantly a diminished audience. Viacom acquiesced, and instead the name of the network was officially changed from the United Paramount Network to simply UPN. As far as Viacom was concerned, those letters no longer had any meaning. To go along with the technically new name, they introduced some new series. And it was 2000, so that means that we've entered the reality TV wave. In an attempt to get their piece of the pie, UPN introduced some reality shows that were interesting. Chains of Love was one of them, though it was originally ordered by NBC. I'm actually just going to directly quote a New York Times article about it here. <clears throat> A photogenic brunette has four illegal aliens chained to her who must spend their days and nights laboring to please her. Their personal space is dictated by a 10-foot chain with wrist and ankle cuffs, which the network says provides a lot of funny physical comedy. Nobody moves, eats, or sleeps without permission of The Link, as the woman at the center of the chain gang is known. She might give her immigrant captives their freedom, or she might not. Meanwhile, they must try to win her affection and get her help securing green cards by cheerfully doing her bidding. Vacuuming, picking up after her teenage sons, washing clothes and dishes, fetching dry cleaning, helping the caterers, following her dog with the pooper scoop and cleaning the neighbor's house for peanuts. At the end of each episode, Miss Linda, as in Miss Linda, should I scrub the bathroom now, will unlock the shackles of one slave who will then run away as fast as possible. Got that? Yeah, this show actually aired. Someone looked at this and thought it was a good idea to put on television. Unsurprisingly, it was panned and it was canceled after its brief six episode run. There was also a show called Manhunt, which was a quote, reality show about people trying to outrun other people who were posing as bounty hunters and the one who outran them the longest won some cash. Quality programming, right? Oh, and Manhunt was later involved in a huge scandal whenever it came out that the producers had actually rigged the show. The FCC had rules in place from the days of the 21 quiz show scandal way back in the 50s forbidding producers from tampering with the outcome of a competition-based show with cash at stake. So this news coming out was not good. The show was also very poorly rated, so UPN pulled the plug on the series after its brief six-episode run. Sounds familiar. After that fiasco, the 2000-2001 season went on as scheduled with relatively little fan. This is the XFL! Oh, look at that, it's time for the XFL. It premiered on Saturday, February 3rd on NBC to 54 million viewers. 100% of that audience pretty much came out of sheer curiosity. No one really knew what to expect from the supposed violent football league, which claimed to put the excitement and thrill back into football. Those wussy NFL rules that made the game, quote, fair, were scrapped in favor of macho XFL rules that made the game exciting. The XFL carries a very interesting story with it, and I'll highly recommend the extraordinary ESPN documentary, This Was the XFL, if you'd like to learn more. It's fascinating, and I highly recommend that you go get your hands on it. But what we are interested in is how it affected UPN. After all, this would be UPN's first time to carry actual sporting events. Well, sort of. There was some growing debate as to whether the XFL was really a game or if it was just a really amped up reality show. Either way, NBC got the good games and those aired on Saturday night. UPN and its cable sister TNN broadcast Sunday night games which weren't quite as sought after. Even still, UPN's performance that first Sunday night was solid with around 4 million viewers. And it was going head to head with ABC's broadcast of an NHL All-Star game which it beat hand with over twice as many viewers. Still, at this point, it was merely morbid curiosity. The next week, while UPN only fell 10% in the numbers, NBC plummeted and garnered an audience only half as large. By week three, it was becoming clear that something wasn't working. Major advertisers began to pack their bags, and NBC's ratings hit only one-third of their original audience, and both UPN and TNN dropped to half of their original audience. Before the end of the first month, ratings had hit less than 2 million for UPN and less than 3 million for NBC, which was lower than all the other members of the Big Four on Sunday night. In fact, the NBC broadcast actually tied with Moesha and the Parkers in the 
their ratings, which should show you how bad it was. And if that wasn't bad enough, it actually got worse. In March, an NBC game got just over 1.5 million viewers, which placed it at 107th place in the ratings that week and was widely believed to be the lowest rated sporting event to ever air on network television. As the season came to an end, questions about another season began to come up. Would NBC carry it? Maybe, but probably not. How about UPN? Possibly, but if neither of those parties were interested, no network would want the damaged goods. And a league can't survive on TNN alone. When the time came, NBC announced that their Saturday night was no longer open to the XFL. UPN was the XFL's only path to survival, and they were initially open to it with one condition. WWF SmackDown had to be reduced to an hour and a half, down from two hours. Vince McMahon did not even consider that condition, and with nowhere to go, Vince McMahon conceded that the XFL had effectively failed, and it was not renewed for a second season. Whether the failure could be credited towards a series of missteps on the WWF's part or just viewer apathy is anyone's guess, but either way, there were no viable suitors for a second season, and the XFL withered away as a one-off failed experiment. And that was the end of that. Again, for more info, check out that documentary or any one of the good videos about it right here on YouTube. Also, hashtag XFL2020. Well, the end of the XFL lands us right at the end of the season, so it's time for the ritual of renewals and removals. To begin with, it was announced that UPN's two stable, reliable hits since practically the beginning, Star Trek Voyager and Moesha, would not be returning. Moesha would be spiritually succeeded by The Parkers, a spinoff that was faring better than Moesha in its most recent season, and Star Trek Voyager would be replaced by Star Trek Enterprise. What, you think they just get rid of all their Star Trek shows? No. They were also also introducing another sitcom with a black cast, this one called One on One, so it was business as usual for UPN. Over on the WB, it was also business as usual. Buffy the Vampire Slayer was still the network's cash cow, and they had every intention of renewing it for the fall 2001 season. However, the production studio, 20th Century Fox Television, saw the numbers for Buffy, and since the WB's broadcast rights to the show had expired, 20th Century Fox was going to be a little bit more stubborn in renegotiations, as the Fox network would like a show of that caliber, as would other networks. The WB was in a position of leverage because if Fox tried to yank away Buffy, Buffy, they'd be heavily weakening the spinoff of Buffy, Angel, which aired immediately following Buffy and which 20th Century Fox also produced. But ultimately, the WB wasn't willing to provide the budget they were looking for, so 20th Century Fox began to seek another network. The obvious choice for them was Fox, but if they took the show to Fox, it'd likely still be a success, but it would look really bad on 20th Century Fox television. If they showed that they would drop a network or Fox any time a show became a hit, that would make other networks quite wary of going into a deal with them, and they knew this. But Fox, uniquely, was also heavily heavily affiliated with UPN, since they owned a bunch of their stations now, and UPN, desperate for a hit, was willing to summon the price that 20th Century Fox was demanding. And so 20th Century Fox dumped the WB and moved Buffy over to UPN, who submitted a 44-episode order to constitute two seasons. The star of Buffy, Sarah Geller, had long been loyal to the WB and had previously stated that she would refuse to go with Buffy if it left the network. But when it did, she was contractually bound to stay on the show, so UPN sent her some watches, diamond necklaces, champagne, and beluga caviar as welcome gifts. The big question on everyone one's mind was, what's going to happen to Angel? Angel was popular, but many credited the popularity with its time slot immediately following Buffy. It made for a nice back-to-back -back Buffy block on the WB, but with the better half of that block absent, the WB had two options as to how to deal with Angel. It could slot another fantasy show in the time slot preceding Angel, and they already had some contenders. If the WB wasn't thrilled with that prospect, though, they had the option to drop the show altogether. If they were to do that, a clause in UPN's contract with 20th Century Fox would come into play, and UPN would be required to pick it up. And UPN would have loved nothing more. The entire Buffy block on UPN might have been the ratings boost they needed to complement WWF SmackDown and deliver some real results for the network. The WB, however, hung on to Angel. There was another WB show, though, called Rosewell, which was also produced by Fox, that made the switch to the UPN alongside Buffy after the WB had dropped it due to meager performance and a massive fan campaign begged UPN to pick it up. With these two shows, the fall lineup was already shaping up to be a lucrative one for UPN. One show, though, that they passed on for the fall season was an adaptation of a British singing competition called Pop Idol. American Network were not very excited at the prospect of a singing competition. Even in the wave of reality TV, no one wanted to take that gamble because it had been tried before to little success. An ABC show, Making the Band, which was about assembling a boy band, had been met with a niche audience rather than the mass appeal ABC was looking for. It lasted one season in 2000 before being dropped by ABC. A WB show called Pop Stars, which had been adapted from Australia, had met a similar fate. So in April of 2001, Simon Cowell came to the United States with his crew to pitch the show to an American network that none of them had ever heard of, UPN. Simon and his crew, which consisted of two other Simons, pitched the idea of the show to the network executives, who 
who seemed disinterested and skeptical. After Simon Cowell finished pitching the show to the network, the meeting went quiet, and after a few more uncomfortable interactions, the meeting ended with an executive declaring, we'll get back with you. Everyone pitching the show knew that to be a very polite way of saying no, but for how poorly the meeting went, they might as well have spat in their face and called them buffoons. The meeting went so poorly, in fact, that Simon Cowell considered it never pitching a show to an American network ever again, but he pushed on. UPN was where they went first, but after that meeting, they made calls to the rest of the broadcast networks and even some cable channels, including MTV, but they all declined. Simon Cowell conceded defeat, and the show did not air in America that season. When the fall lineup in 2001 premiered in early October, Buffy provided just the results UPN had hoped for, roping in nearly 8 million viewers upon the season debut. Rosewell also performed moderately well, WWF SmackDown slumped a little bit but continued to do well, The Parker still had an audience, and Star Trek Enterprise beat out all of the other networks upon its debut, and it remained steady at 9 million viewers an episode. However, the WB had some tricks up its sleeve. Even with its signature show gone, the Gilmore Girls slid into Buffy's old time slot where it fared even better than its predecessor, and shows like Smallville, Reba, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch all came along and gathered their own audiences, which meant a tight race for fifth place. In December of 2001, yet another big business move took place. Up to this point, UPN had been under the jurisdiction of Paramount Television, a subset of Paramount Pictures, and a sub-subset of Viacom. In addition to UPN, Paramount Television also produced and distributed a whole host of TV shows, though by 2001, they had been noticeably waning in their hit-to-non-hit ratio. If you remember from before, the CEO of Paramount Television was a guy named Kerry McCluggage, who had been the CEO for over a decade and had overseen the launch of UPN in 1995. Well, in 2001, Mel Karmazin announced a reorganization. UPN would be moved to the CBS branch of the company, which meant that Leslie Moonves, who had done a fantastic job revitalizing CBS into the number one network in the nation, would be in control of UPN from that point forward. In wake of this news, Kerry McCluggage resigned. The move also drove Dean Valentine out of his position as head of the network less than a month later, as he described here. Well, I didn't make the decision to leave. I was for CBS took over less, was given responsibility for UPN. My contract guaranteed me full authority creatively, whatever the hell that meant when you didn't have any money, but it certainly, formally, uh, I didn't have to listen to anybody in terms of what shows I put on, and Les wasn't the kind of guy to work in that way anyway, if you know Les Moonves. Uh, so it was clear, wasn't we just weren't meant to, there was no way we could actually work together. Uh, and uh, so it was just, even from the first time we met, it was like, you know, let's talk, let's have the lawyers talk, and, and uh, I mean, there was not, neither of us ever thought for a second that we wanted to work together, and that was it. He was replaced by a woman who we'll be referring to as Dawn. She came to UPN from the Lifetime Network, which she had propelled to popularity, especially among women. Leslie Moonves had selected her because she had experience with female audiences, and he wanted to broaden the audience of UPN. Things were hectic enough, but in the higher offices of Viacom, the relationship between Mel Karmazin and Sumner Redstone seemed to be crumbling even further. Though they dismissed the rumors of an unhappy marriage between the two, it was hard to ignore the signs. For one, Sumner Redstone had adamantly tried to steer clear of UPN, being relocated in the manner that it did because because he feared that the executives would depart, and that's exactly what happened when Mel Karmazin made the move without consulting Redstone first. And that was far from the only kerfuffle that these two executives were caught in. When Redstone wanted to throw a lavish Christmas party for the company's executives, complete with live music, Karmazin prevented Redstone from using company money to throw the party. Out of spite, Redstone paid for the party out of his own pocket, and though Karmazin did show up, he understandably left very early. Redstone was not the only guy upset with Karmazin. Executives at divisions that had been traditionally controlled by Viacom, including the MTV network, works led by Tom Freston, were understandably upset when Karmazin, who was still viewed as the CBS guy, began making cuts to their divisions and, in their minds, overstepping his boundaries. Karmazin was rumored to be resigning in the near future because of the increasing hostility between him and a big chunk of the rest of the company. However, Wall Street did not want that to happen, because not only was he a great businessman when it came to keeping the dollar signs nice and big, but for as long as Karmazin was there, it meant that Redstone, who was getting older quick, had a clear and respected successor for when he inevitably stepped down. Karmazin's solid contract also meant that unless the board overwhelmingly turned out against him, he would not be going anywhere. Redstone had tried to convince the board to get rid of Karmazin's contract, but they didn't. So he tried to pressure Karmazin himself into leaving the company, but despite Redstone's best efforts to push him out the door without technically forcing him to, Karmazin did not budge. Redstone had even gone so far as to formulate a plan to replace Karmazin with three men who would jointly share the role of president, Les Moonves, Tom Freston, and Jonathan Dolgen. All three executives were leading their respective divisions with great degrees of success, and they all expressed very 
very little interest in leaving their position. As such, the board nixed the decision and Karmazin sure wasn't going anywhere on his own. So Redstone did the only thing that he could. He announced that he simply would not be renewing Karmazin's contract whenever it expired in 2003. Redstone had hoped that such a bold announcement would convince the board to terminate Karmazin's contract on the spot, but they didn't. So Redstone was stuck with Karmazin for another year and some change. Rumors about where Karmazin would go after his forced departure seemed to point toward Disney, which was not doing great because of the fading leadership skills of their CEO, Michael Eisner. And rumors suggested that he'd take Les Moonves with him to fix up the floundering ABC. That would have been a double whammy, especially for Viacom shareholders who held those two executives near and dear. With all of this instability and uncertainty, it led several to rethink the benefits of a combined CBS and Viacom. Viacom concurrently reported a $1.1 billion loss for 2001, which can ironically be traced back to one of the first public disputes between the two executives, the decision to hang on to Blockbuster. Though Karmazin had won that argument way back in 1999, now it was losing massive amounts of money. 2001 was also the year that Enron fell apart. For what it was worth, UPN was not helping out with those numbers, as it had never actually turned a dime of profit, but Leslie and Don were hoping they could change that. One of the first things they did, strangely, was change the logo from this to this. They did this to officially signal a change in attitude and a new era for the network. It also helped distance the network from Paramount since Paramount was no longer a parent, just a sibling. When they introduced the shows for the 2002-2003 season that would signify the new direction for the network, there was a show about ghosts to compliment Buffy's female audience, a new television adaptation of The Twilight Zone to compliment Star Trek Enterprise's audience, and a new show called Half and Half that aimed to compliment the Parker's black audience in addition to the girlfriends which got renewed, and WWF Smackdown, or actually WWE Smackdown now, also stuck around so that they could retain their male audience, though it was becoming clear that wrestling was no longer in its heyday. For as much hype that surrounded the change in leadership, the programming lineup was clearly not too different from the Valentine era of the network. Like in the Valentine era, they once again passed on a show being shopped around from the UK. Pop Idol, after a successful first season in the UK, was once again shopped around to the US networks. This time, the Simons focused on the big four. All of them initially declined. However, Rupert Murdoch's daughter had seen the show and urged him to pick it up, and he trusted her, and he decided to bring the show to Fox. Furthermore, when the executives of the network were looking for ways to alter the format to make it more viable for a US audience, Murdoch stepped in and adamantly insisted that the show remain just as it was in the UK. It was not a popular decision in the network's corporate offices, but once it premiered in the summer, those frowns slowly turned upside down. Upon its first few shows, it received little fanfare, but a solid viewer base. So solid and unchanging, in fact, that whenever the numbers came rolling back, some people were actually a little bit confused. The show had become sort of a sleeper hit while no one was paying attention. As fall rolled around, the show really picked up steam and often landed in the top five shows to air in network television television for the week, occasionally taking the number one spot. Needless to say, UPN began to wish that when they had said they would get back with Simon Cowell one year earlier, that they had actually followed through. They desperately needed a hit because, once again, they finished in dead last for the season. As they had several times before, rumors regarding how much longer the network would stick around began to stir. Leslie and Don were still optimistic that they could turn the network situation around, but they hadn't shown that they were skilled enough to do that in their first season in power. The executives had faith in their skills in the network business, but if the network continued to hemorrhage money, the executives would eventually be forced to pull the plug. Something needed to change for UPN. Up in the higher offices of Viacom, though, everyone was trying their hardest to avoid change. That is, changing the president of the company. After their nasty disputes up before, Mel and Redstone were able to work things out a little bit and take the relationship from a broken marriage to a marriage where they're making things work so as not to upset their children, or in this case, their stockholders. The tension between the two had more or less dissipated, and the two men were being less hostile toward each other. Redstone, though, still couldn't seem to make up his mind as to whether he wanted Karmazin to stick around. Some days he seemed totally optimistic that Karmazin was there to stay, while other days he circulated articles around the company, suggesting that Karmazin's departure would actually benefit the company. That made predictions of what the final outcome would be significantly more difficult. Karmazin had entered contract renegotiations, which meant that Redstone wasn't going to stick by his declaration not to renew his contract. But the talks were not going smoothly because Karmazin wanted his power to be expanded, while Redstone wanted it limited. What Karmazin wanted more than anything was for Redstone to retire already so that he could take over as CEO, but that didn't seem to be on the horizon. For all the good it would do anyway, since Redstone still owned over two-thirds of the company, so it wouldn't be like Karmazin had unchecked power. But be the move that advanced his career in the way he wanted it to go. The ultimate issue of the negotiations would be whether Mel's big decisions would have to go through the board or through Redstone. Finally, with the deadline near and uncertainty rampant, the negotiations picked up some steam and by March of 2003, the new contract they had reached was announced. Mel would stick around at the company for three more years, which was good enough news for shareholders. But the deal came with a number of strange asterisks. Karmazin was no longer the designated heir to the post of CEO for one, but Redstone had much more leeway in the event that Redstone wanted Karmazin out before his contract was over. Redstone also 
also had more power to overrule Carmisen's decisions, and some higher level decisions required the two men to be in agreement. Redstone also had full control of the board, which was still jointly controlled by members of Viacom and CBS, but Redstone can change that at a whim. The contract was described as comparable to a peace treaty between sovereign nations rather than a deal between executives at the same company. The deal did not help hatch the relations between the two, and they still rarely interacted socially despite Redstone's affinity for doing so. Mel Carmisen did keep in touch with Les Moonves though, and a key point that he hammered home to Les was that if something didn't change soon at UPN, he would yank it right off the air. Les heard the message loud and clear, but the 2003-2004 season was shaping up to be a rocky one. For one thing, Buffy would not be returning. UPN's 44 episode order had run out, and the show ended outright. Spiritually replacing the show was a show about a technology whiz with superhuman abilities called Jake 2.0, which Dawn was hoping would really be the smash hit they were looking for. There were more sitcoms for the black audience as well, including All of Us, which had the creative forces of Will and Jada Smith, and there was also Eve, which, like Moesha, had a singer at the forefront. And as to be expected, Star Trek, WWE SmackDown, and all the other black sitcoms returned once again. There were some shows tailored to younger audiences as well, but when you see a concept like a show about two roofers who have mullet haircuts and the last name Mullet, appropriately called The Mullets, it doesn't look like a hit in the making. After the runaway success of American Idol, every network scrambled to scrape together their own competition shows. Some lasted, while others didn't. UPN's take on the format was the brainchild of Tyra Banks, the supermodel who rather appropriately started up a show based on selecting the best model out of a group of 10 contestants. The show turned out to be more successful than most had thought, especially considering the shoddy success rate of shows in the genre. It improved its audience with every passing week, and UPN didn't hesitate to order a second season once those numbers started rolling in. UPN finally had a hit on their hands. However, other shows, including Jake 2.0, were canned, despite the critical acclaim that show received. Overall, however, America's Next Top Model, along with her tried and true black sitcoms, propelled them to fifth place after a dismal season at the WB. It didn't help with the public's perception of the network, which Mad TV managed to sum up in a skit that pretty much speaks for itself. Tonight on the Hollywood Squares, a very special show featuring all of the stars of the UPN Network. From her hit sitcom Eve, Eve! From Star Trek Enterprise, a Klingon! And here's your host, Tom Bergeron! Thank you, thank you very much, and hello, UPN stars! Hi, Hi Tom! Tom. <laughs> God. That's brutal. Hey, you know what else is brutal? Football. And earlier that season at CBS, it was the 2004 Super Bowl, the behemoth of a football game watched annually by practically everyone in the country. CBS was broadcasting the game, and the revered halftime show was produced by their corporate sibling, MTV. It was a match made in heaven, right? MTV gets to sell some music, CBS gets a good show that the young audience likes. What more could you ask for? Well, they probably should have asked for the show to come without a nationwide television ethics scandal, because when Justin Timberlake removed part of Janet Jackson's top during their joint halftime show, the nation went bonkers. Everyone was upset, and the blame ultimately landed on Viacom, whose MTV was barred from producing another halftime show, and whose CBS was fined $550,000, a record at the time, by the FCC. It was a huge stink, and unfortunately, it was the starting point of some rough times at Viacom, and the catalyst for the changes that occurred over the course of the next year. For one thing, Viacom finally made the move to sell off Block to its shareholders after reporting huge losses in their fourth quarter. That already signaled a big change for Viacom, but an enormous change came seemingly out of the blue on June 2nd, 2004, when Mel Carmazin abruptly announced his resignation from Viacom. He had long been contemplating it privately, but the straw that broke the camel's back was a combination of two factors. For one, Sherry Redstone, Sumner Redstone's daughter, had just moved to New York. She had managed the theater chain National Amusements, which was privately run by the Redstone family and was the holding company for Viacom. She usually stayed out of Viacom Viacom's business because running the theater chain was plenty for her to manage in addition to her children. But now that they were out on their own, she made the move she had long been planning. She had been a board member at Viacom, but she would be more of an advisor to the man in charge with her symbolic relocation to the Big Apple. Sherry and Mel had never got along with one another, and he feared that Sherry would be given control of the company upon Sumner stepping down, which he announced that he planned to do within the next three years. His fears were affirmed whenever he heard that during a private meeting, a confidential shortlist of potential contenders for the job of CEO had been composed, and Mel was informed that he was not on the list. With that, he cut his losses and left. Mel wanted to be in control, and he came to terms with the simple fact that it would not happen at Viacom. He acknowledged that even if Redstone had changed his mind and gave him the role of CEO, Redstone would still be the majority owner and the chairman of the board, so he'd still be reporting to Redstone and would not have the degree of power and independence from Redstone that he wanted. He soon ended up as the head of Sirius and took Howard Stern, who Carmazin had helped propel to stardom, with him. With Carmazin out of the picture at Viacom, Redstone put the plan he had long wanted into effect. 
Les Moonves and Tom Freston both got promoted to the role of president, and they jointly shared the role. If you remember from earlier, Redstone's plan to put a trio of executives into Mel's position included these two and Jonathan Dolgen, who had a tense relationship with both of these men, but had done great things for Paramount Pictures. After hearing that he was not included in the promotion, he immediately resigned out of frustration. Les and Tom had very similar jobs prior to the promotion, it was just that one was broadcast and the other was cable, but that was about it. They also more or less would continue to manage their divisions. Les would still oversee CBS and UPN, in addition to the radio broadcasting unit and the Paramount Television Production Studio, and Tom would oversee the MTV networks along with Paramount Pictures. The two men were very good friends as well. They had taken vacations together and were seen as a good duo. However, with Redstone merely a lame duck, that made both men the sole contenders for his chair. By the time 2006 rolled around, everyone knew that there would be a battle for the throne, and regardless of how it ended, the defeated man would likely leave the company. And for as good as these two men got along when their relationship was pretty much limited to the Nickelodeon block on CBS, their styles of running things differed greatly. Tom was pretty laid back, while Les was somewhat of a micromanager. Though it was believed that this duo would eliminate tension between the president and the CEO, they didn't take into account the tension it would create between the two presidents. Regardless, the partnership was off to a happy start as the two pushed the issue of succession far down the road and, in contrast to Mel, tried to focus more on the creative side of the company rather than just the bottom line. After their first quarter in power, they reported good news back to their shareholders and Viacom seemed to be a well-oiled machine with good leadership in place. Sure, there was the issue of replacing the three men who had either resigned or been promoted, and the stock was only slowly recovering from the significant losses of before, but it was not enough to mess with Wall Street's confidence in the company. Plus, they had just spun off the dying blockbuster, so the future looked bright. As the 2004 season was kicking off, things were also looking bright for UPN, who entered the season with strong ad sales after a long dry spell. Riding on the success of America's Next Top Model, they were motivated to try and retain fifth place. So, with the Parkers ending and the ratings for all of their black focus shows slipping, they tried a reality show about the Amish, which ruffled some feathers, along with a reality show about competitive heartbreaking, a legal drama, another sitcom from Ralph Farquhar, if you remember him, a spinoff of the still going one-on-one, -on -one, which was set in a hair salon, and most notably, Veronica Mars. Star Trek also got shuffled around after narrowly avoiding cancellation. Veronica Mars was the only show to really pick up steam, and it was tapping into a younger, more WB-esque audience with its high school student turned private eye concept. America's Next Top Model, though, remained on top, and it had acquired the title of the most consistently successful show UPN had ever had. Things looked to be solid for UPN, and even after the WB season got going, they fell behind UPN again. UPN had solidly taken back fifth place. That was good news for Les Moonves because he was trying to prove himself more than ever. The date of Summoner Redstone's quote retirement was drawing nearer and nearer. Tom Freston and Les Moonves were having trouble coexisting, and the battle for the throne was not going to be pretty. Viacom's stock price had stopped growing, which didn't please investors in the slightest. From the time the merger took place in 1999, the stock of the company had fallen by more than 20% with no signs of a sudden resurgence. The original intent for the merger was to have one company with every demographic and medium available for advertising so that advertisers could strike up deals with one company that had everything they wanted. However, it failed to provide the results anyone had hoped for, and the shaky situation with leadership did not help much with investor certainty. With a succession crisis looming, a third option was introduced alongside the option of having one man or the other run the company, split the company back in two, restoring things more or less to the way they were, and forget the merger even happened. The two companies would still continue to be owned by National Amusements, but aside from that, they'd be independent from each other. Les could run CBS, and Tom could run what was left of Viacom. That would certainly clean up the management issues. Plus, with two separate companies, the stockholder has clearer definitions of what each company is trying to be, where they were going, and how quickly they were getting there. With the benefit of hindsight, it became clear that merging the two companies was more a recipe for conflict than a recipe for profit. So, the talks proceeded, and eventually, the board approved the split for the summer of 2005. There were some oddities that had to be sorted out regarding the split. With the two men as president, both of them had carved out the areas of the company that they oversaw. For the most part, they kept it where they had previously presided, with Les still being the CBS guy and Tom handling more Viacom-esque things. Les, however, took over the Paramount Television Studio and the theme parks. Tom also oversaw TV Land, a cable channel that used a lot of CBS shows for reruns. With the split of the company, both men would continue to oversee their divisions, which meant that Paramount would be split up between two separate companies for the first time, the theme parks would have to renegotiate licensing deals for the rides that use Nickelodeon characters, and TV Land would have to renegotiate broadcast rights for CBS shows. These were far from the only complications, but none of this deterred the split. Some properties had already changed hands. All of Viacom's TV stations were now CBS properties, the book publisher was a CBS company now, and both of Viacom's movie-based cable channels were also filed away as CBS properties. Viacom had taken a few things as well, most notably CBS's two cable channels, CMT, and what was now known as Spike. But most importantly for us, UPN was reclassified as a CBS company in 2001, so when the split of the company took place, UPN would be going with Leslie to CBS. The split of the two companies was completed in January of 2006, though it spiritually went into effect long before that. The company that was known as Viacom changed its name to the CBS Corporation, and Leslie Moonves became the CEO. A new company which bore the Viacom name and a fancy 
its new logo was created and the properties that belonged to it were moved over. UPN went to CBS and was now somewhat of an orphan. The network had been launched by a movie studio that wanted to get into TV big time, but now it was in the hands of a company that had few ties to the movie studio and was already very successful in TV. And with the performance of UPN being more or less unchanging over the course of a decade, the likelihood of CBS keeping it around appeared to dwindle. As the split was going through though, UPN kept trucking along as if nothing was happening. For the fall 2005 season, by far the biggest new show was a comedy based on the teenage years of Chris Rock called Everybody Hates Chris. Now look, I try to be pretty impartial in these videos, but I have to say that this show is probably the best one to ever come out of UPN. If you've never watched it, watch it. The show was widely regarded as too good for UPN and the show with the most hit potential on any network that season. But Chris Rock had always respected UPN for remembering the black audience, and when he brought his show there first, they were all too happy to to accept. Some, however, thought that CBS might actually take the show to their network if it proved to be a hit. Others were claiming that the show would do to UPN what The Simpsons did to Fox. Reports of the show being the best new show of the year were everywhere, and UPN rolled with the praise by initiating an enormous ad campaign to drum up hype for the show. It worked, and prior to its airing, Everybody Hates Chris was easily the most talked about show for the 2005 season. There were some other new shows that launched with less fanfare. One, a comedy about matchmaking, one, a reality show about Britney Spears while she went on tour, and the last, a drama about a group of Hollywood drifters in their 20s. Wrestling also made the move to Friday Night, which was a historically weak slot meant to house shows headed for the grave, which earned the nickname of the Death Slot. But for an event like WWE SmackDown, it actually managed to provide a little bit of growth to the slumping series. Once the season kicked off, UPN showed that it wasn't going down without a fight, and Everybody Hates Chris was the most successful comedy in the network's history, while America's Next Top Model and Veronica Mars continued to impress. Leslie Moonves' wife even appeared in the second season premiere of Veronica Mars for some reason. The WB later debuted a lineup that put them even further behind UPN by levels reminiscent of the two networks' performances when they had just gotten going. For the first time in a long time, things were really lining up in UPN's favor. For all the good it did since UPN was owned by CBS, who had no incentive to try and propel the network to fifth place since they owned the number one network in television. UPN had also still never once generated profit, though they had neared the line of breaking even. For the WB's part, it had only twice given profit, and for all the good shows it had, it was falling behind UPN. Time Warner and CBS both recognized that these two networks couldn't just squirm on like this forever. Something had to change. Change. As the season proceeded and the WB continued to struggle, Leslie Moonves and Barry Meyer, who was the chairman of Warner Brothers Entertainment, were attending a dinner party in November of 2005. The two began to talk about their small networks. They each had a decent number of popular shows, but not enough to propel either network to big boy status. They each had a relatively similar audience that was being split between the two networks. Then Leslie and Barry had a crazy idea. What if the two longtime rivals were to join forces? Would that be the answer they were both looking for? Would it solve their problems? The talks proceeded with extraordinary secrecy, and even executives at the networks found out about the meetings and the decisions that were made within days of their announcement to the public. Leslie and Barry reached an agreement that meant an end to the longtime rivalry. Both UPN and the WB would cease operations at the start of the 2006-2007 season. Spiritually replacing the networks would be one joint venture between CBS and Time Warner, a network that would supposedly combine the best of the UPN with the best of the WB with a few extra new shows for the new season. The talks were completed by January, and the two executives announced the new network called the CW. Professor, what does the C and the W stand for? Okay, so we have C for CBS, which used to own UPN, plus W for Warner Brothers equals CW. The name was met with initial resistance since it didn't have any key links to either of the companies launching it, and people unfamiliar with the network assumed it was an acronym for Country Western, Carsey Warner, or Chuck Woolery. Some cynics in the industry immediately began dubbing it the Can't Win Network, but the speculation wasn't unfounded, especially considering that Les Moonves did not want to cannibalize his treasured CBS. He confirmed those rumors by announcing that even though his network would be profitable, it would still be geared toward a more niche young audience. For all the negative press the name received, Wall Street seemed to embrace the new network. The one group that did not not quite embrace this change was station owners. In markets that had two stations, one for the WB and the other for UPN, since only one network would be succeeding those two, that would leave one station without a network affiliation. These stations were not happy, as most of them had bet a lot on the success, or if nothing else, the longevity of these networks. These stations had carved out 30 hours of programming for the network lineup, and they had no syndication agreements prepared for when the network was out of the picture. The largest station owner to get the shaft was Fox Television Stations, who bought a 
bunch of UPN affiliates. See, the WB was still partially owned by the station group, Tribune, so they had first dibs on affiliation with the new network, which competed with Fox's stations in nearly every market. Fox, with a ton of huge stations that would be left to languish, recognized the opportunity that came from the desperate need for a new network from stations that had been abandoned. With this in mind, they immediately got to work creating My Network, which was meant to flip the bird to the CW and go head to head with it. However, everyone knew that a network could not be scraped together from virtually nothing by September, so the only thing that My Network got on their roster was a group of telenovelas, which are modeled after Mexican soap operas. They would air nightly under a strange broadcast schedule reminiscent of typical daytime soap operas. As bad as this whole setup clearly was, it meant that stations didn't have to go out and find 30 hours of syndicated programming to fill up prime time. The CW showed significant promise, especially with UPN's dawn running things. The UPN shows that made the switch over were America's Next Top Model, Veronica Mars, Everybody Hates Chris, Girlfriends, All of Us, and of course, WWE Smackdown. There was also a list of WB shows that made the transition. Of course, all of this was going on in January, and the switch wasn't going to occur until the start of the next season in September. Both networks continued to roll out the rest of the new episodes in their lineup. Once the season ended, neither of the networks put out summer shows, and the final three months of their lives were almost entirely reruns, with the exception of WWE Smackdown on UPN, and one WB show that, for some reason, leaked into summer. The CW was set to launch, and immediately began its fall schedule on September 18th, 2006. Many UPN affiliates, including the ones owned by Fox, abandoned the UPN affiliation in the first week of September, as My Network began its fall season on September 5th, leaving the last few weeks of UPN's life without much of an audience. For markets that still had a UPN station, they would have seen the network's final moments on Friday, September 15th, 2006. Now, the WB had decided to do an extravagant goodbye on the following Sunday, with their entire primetime lineup for the night being dubbed the Night of Favorites and Farewells, being comprised entirely of pilots for shows that ended up as hits. The WB ended its 11-year run with a brief, albeit sad, montage of some of the network's stars before the network's mascot, Michigan J. Frog, took a bow as the word goodbye filled the screen. The network then went off the air for good. UPN, which ended two days earlier, had a much more understated closure. With little fanfare, the network simply showed the routine episode of WWE SmackDown, and as the episode ended, along with it went UPN. For those curious, these were what the final moments of the network would have looked like. And with that fade to black, UPN ended its turbulent 11-year run. The CW premiered as scheduled on September 18th, 2006. For its first week on the air, it showed mostly season finales of the series that would be making the switch over to the new network. The network was launched with great fanfare, but it quickly became apparent that in spite of the network being the best of both worlds, it was not going to have twice the audience of either preceding network as they had hoped. The network officially began airing first-run content on September 20th with the premiere of a new season of America's Next Top Model. After the CW's first season that proved to be much rockier than what they had initially hoped for, they decided to restructure their lineup a bit to exclusively cater to female audiences. The biggest side effect of this move was relinquishing the rights to the WWE SmackDown to My Network, who had managed to absolutely tank in their first season and had dropped all of their telenovelas in favor of reality TV shows and movies. WWE SmackDown was given to the cable network Sci-Fi in 2010 when My Network decided not to be a broadcast network and made the move to being merely a syndication service in 2009, similarly to Ion Television. My Network and Ion routinely take the 6th and 7th spots respectively, while the CW has clung tight to their 5th place status, rarely ever moving up or down. UPN shows that made the switch to the CW slowly began to get dropped one by one. The longest holdout was America's Next Top Model, which was by far the biggest hit for the network in its early days. The CW held onto it until 2015, until they finally gave it the axe after over a decade on the air. VH1 then picked up the show, and it exists there today, being the only UPN show still in production. Even though the CW W launched to wishes that it could really replicate the success of Fox over a decade after the fact, from day one, it had only rarely broken free from its fifth place spot. Now, chances are that given the plate tectonic shift in the industry, there's no way that it would have succeeded anyway, as we can see from the CW now, which is continuing to fail, uh, probably at a more aggressive rate than UPN ever did. For whatever reason, it's being kept alive. The moment will come where it's shut down. Um, the business doesn't need it anymore. It didn't need that then. It doesn't need it now we kind of those networks outlived the network moment and uh they were just the, in terms of the need of another broadcast network right the, the world had changed to a cable world and a niche world and the the, the broadcast world was over um but here we are f a week a few weeks from the uh, the change over to digital and the cw is still there it's still there but it's losing 50 million dollars a year you know it's being kept there probably out of you know the need of out of ego needs because you, you don't want to shut it down uh, it looks bad to shut down a network, 
but it will be, trust me, it, it'll be shut down. Yeah, I mean, that's gonna, that's gonna go away. Um, but as I said, that's sort of inevitable. The network business itself will go away uh, because, or at least will change so radically that it won't look anything like what it looks like now. Despite that prediction, the CW and my network for that matter are still on the airwaves and they're probably not going anywhere. The CW today has benefited from some cult hits, specifically those that derive from Time Warner's DC comics that have done good things in the streaming world. Where UPN was regarded as a joke, which was epitomized in that Mad TV sketch, the CW is just a perennial B network. It's not trying to be a member of the big four anymore and that makes it less laughable than UPN was. It knows its place and it's found an audience and it likely won't break from that until they absolutely have to. Then, and only then, will Dean Valley Valentine's prediction likely come to fruition. In May of 2018, the CW officially outlasted UPN. When walking through the television graveyard, UPN sticks out as having a story that's unique. The WB always had an image, and its downfall was the result of merely some underwhelming programming lineups. UPN, though, was always more troubled. Among the broadcast networks that are no more, UPN's story shines through the rest as being truly something else. From a gigantic hype campaign just prior to the network's launch, to the underwhelming fade to black 11 years after the fact, UPN had a wild ride. It had a strong start that showed that Fox's rise might not have been a one-time thing. It didn't last long, and shoddy programming, questionable management, and a corporate mess left this network without a clear direction. UPN today isn't remembered for much other than being a failure. Some may remember it as the network for black actors and black audiences, and in the political climate of the modern day, that has been a trait respected by activists. However, even for the positive feedback that that aspect of the network gets, CBS has tried their best to pretend that the network never existed. While Time Warner has revived the WB brand for various purposes, most notably a streaming service that lasted for five years, the UPN brand has not been heard from or even referenced by CBS since 2006. Even shows that aired on UPN are branded as CBS shows on platforms like Hulu. The Paramount Television Studio, which CBS received after Viacom and CBS split, was nixed by CBS and replaced with a production studio that bore the CBS name, ending Paramount's involvement with television after nearly three quarters of a century. In 2018, Viacom rebranded their Spike cable channel as the Paramount Network, but it is clearly not intended to be a successor to the late broadcast network, though it does mark the fourth time that Paramount has formed a TV network. Paramount Network was also the proposed name for UPN, as Chris Kraft sold back their shares, so maybe, even if it has practically nothing in common with UPN, it's meant to be a subtle nod to the network after all. Today. UPN lives on only in America's next top model as far as first-run shows go. WWE SmackDown also continues today on cable. Other shows, mostly UPN's more successful sitcoms, have proven to be viable in syndication, and it's not uncommon to see shows like Moesha or The Parkers in your channel guide in the present day. The two Star Trek shows have also remained popular among fans of the franchise. But no show could do to UPN what The Simpsons did to Fox. Maybe, had they rolled with Malcolm in the Middle, or decided to consider a US version of Pop Idol, they would have really gotten somewhere. But as we all know, that didn't happen. And for most people, including CBS's own executives, UPN is little more than a distant memory. It's a footnote. Having failed to truly rock the TV world, in spite of huge hopes and a genuine effort up to the very end. The United Paramount Network, in spite of the huge and crazy life it led, is today just one headstone in the middle of a vast graveyard.